So we're really excited today. Today, um, if you guys know, I geek out a little bit over this person. I'm a self-proclaimed Gypsy. Uh, so this is the first time we've really met in person yeah. and spent time together. Yeah, sure is. But I kind of feel over familiar because we've kind of been chit-chatting. We've been on LinkedIn. We've been on Instagram. So, And we've yeah. also done your podcast. Right. You guys were on my podcast, which yeah, I love. I've really enjoyed that. And you're way involved. Yeah. I mean, uh, between you and Anne, I see y'all. I mean, maybe overcommitted, honestly. <laughs> Tell us about that a little bit. What is the, the big events that you have here in Utah? Yeah, so there's there's quite a lot. I got here Saturday, and then on Sunday yesterday, I was speaking on a panel, and the Sleep Research Society um, invited Project Sleep, that I'm. we'll probably talk about. It's a nonprofit that I'm on the board for. Um, and so they wanted a panel of three um people living with sleep disorders to share their lived experience. And it was such a wonderful experience because the people in the audience were all new researchers in sleep. So we're able to just, I mean, my talk was pretty much like, here's my story and here's where it would have been great to have had research that you guys can now go and do. So we loved it. It was great. And it's just so nice to see patient advocates part of the discussion. And then this morning, I got to see my dear friend, founder and CEO of Project Sleep, Julie Flyer, get a really nice award. So that was wonderful. And I'm here. And then later today, I'm on the expert advisory board. I'm the first um, patient advocate to be on an expert advisory board that I know of for a sleep ma- uh, CPAP manufacturer. And so React Health are having a meeting later, so I'll be at that. Great group of people, by the way. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. There are are not enough hours in the day when you're here. Um, uh, Not necessarily in Houston, but meeting for the sleep conference. Um, uh, Chris Allen, who's uh, a friend of mine, he also is is very heavy in in, uh, Instagram and social media, uh, neurologist, sleep medicine specialist. He said, I refer to this conference as the hypocrisy conference. Yes. <laughs> he said, because you bring in 5,000 sleep professionals yes. and they don't sleep all That's day. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> and they schedule yoga for 7 a.m. and stuff. And I'm just like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, were you just at a dinner till like 11? Yeah, it's not. So yeah, we. I definitely pay attention to going to bed early and having like time in case I need to nap in the middle of the day. So so one of the things I think is really important, and I've actually had received feedback recently that... Um, from people who watch the podcast and are like, you know, I would really like for you to have more patient journeys, patient stories. And and so there's there's two parts to what I'm about to say is one, I so appreciate the fact that you utilize your lived experience to be able to educate and uh, encourage behavioral change for just the space in general, but for people living the same journey, right? Yeah. The second part to that is I love the fact that you have your own specific mission with your podcast and your efforts but now is additive to Project Sleep. Um, uh, similar to you, I work with Project Sleep. I'm I'm very fortunate to be a part of their expert advisory board and am just such a fangirl of Julie. Um, the, the, we always joke that we both met when we were in our sleep infancy. Um, uh-huh. uh, so it was actually at the what used to be called the Sleep Research Network. And um, uh, Cy from University of Arizona, he had gotten a PCORI grant to develop this network. And uh, Julie was presenting about her story. This was when she was still working for the Pancreatic Cancer yes. Society. Yeah. Wow. And she was just getting uh, Project Sleep off the ground. Yes. Now, Julie is a person living with narcolepsy type 1 mm-hmm. and has um, a lot of effort in raising awareness and education but her mantra and really the the mission of Project Sleep is number one, make sleep cool, yep. right? But number two, really making a change within the landscape. And uh, the biggest thing is the hotline. I mean, the new hotline from Project Sleep yeah. is is a game changer. Tell us a little bit about your involvement in that and how you're seeing that already starting to flourish. Yeah, so I first met Julie actually because I'd read her book and um, there aren't very many memoirs about living with a sleep disorder. So I had read her book and I just loved it so much. Um, and so I was kind of a bit of a fan. 
Um, and I'd been following a little bit what she was doing with Project Sleep, especially around um, advocacy in DC. And there's just a lot of really interesting things. So I had her come on my podcast. And honestly, I think she was just like, who is this woman with the sleep apnea podcast? And, you know, but after that, I just was like, we're just going to be friends. Yes. And she just had to get on board. Yes. <laughs> yes. You really she, didn't she didn't know it yet. She didn't know it yet. So I initially got involved just by trying to amplify everything they did and their message. And then I was able to, a few years ago, I... I did the Rising Voices I was going to just ask you that, yeah. So they, it started out as Rising Voices of Narcolepsy. And so I said to Julie, like, have you had people with other sleep disorders do that program? So what it is, it's a speaker training program where they take people with sleep disorders and really help them um, hone a, a sort of 25-minute presentation that they can give in all different, like, to companies, to schools, like, wherever they can find speaking opportunities. And I'd done a little speaking, but I hadn't really looked at, well, how can I get my message across about my journey and all that? So I loved that. And so I helped them kind of tailor it for people with sleep apnea so oh, that they very could come after me. Yes. Um, and then we, we kind of, you know, me and Julie did become reciprocal friends. Like it wasn't just me following her around. <laughs> so um, she started following you around. Then we. <laughs> No, we just like became friends. So then I, I kind of, you know, said to her, like, you know, if you, we talked about maybe me joining the board of Project Sleep. So I did that a couple of years ago. Um, and then I just was appointed chair at the beginning of this year. Okay. And so one of the things with the sleep helpline was there wasn't, a, it was crazy to us that there wasn't a national free helpline where people with sleep problems could call in and just get, the basics on, you know, like go through a screener even, you know? So we have Heather, who's wonderful, who's Matt Horsnell's wife, which is really funny. And if you don't know Matt, Matt is a person living with a central disorder of hypersomnolence. Yeah. And he is a huge advocate as well. Kind of famous yeah. in this space. Yes. So Heather just had a really great background in counseling and, you know, just really was excited to take this on. And so we set about... You know, you mentioned being on our expert advisory board. So we lent on some of the people on the expert advisory board and um, other board members. And we developed a lot of um, information about all different sleep disorders and also like a sort of bank of information of where to send people. So Heather, when people call, like it could be just that they're looking for an AASM sleep clinic, right? That, that's accredited, that's near to sure. them. So there's that, and then there's other people where, you know, they just don't know where to start. Like, you know, it sounds like they have insomnia. So then we can send them maybe to a CBTI professional in their sure, area. Sure. So she, as it's been growing, like, it's amazing. I just saw some data back from the, the sleep helpline, and it's amazing that we're getting such a broad range of people. We just kind of thought because Project Sleep's programming had started in the narcolepsy space, we would have mainly narcolepsy people calling, but it hasn't been that way at all. It's been like a real broad range of insomnia and sleep apnea and exactly what we envisaged, right? Wow. Just being this this awesome. really broad ranging, um, you know, resource for people. So yeah, it's been great. Can I, I have, you know, I, I think about metrics all the time. I, I'm just that because, you know, is it scalable, right? Can yeah. this be, so do y'all know how many calls you get on average a month? Oh, is that I, a fair question to ask? Is that even, no, that they do have metrics on that. Okay. I just don't know them off the top of my head. But yeah. I'm curious if you get calls from like, uh, I love this, by the way, you know, yeah. uh, from someone who cares about somebody. My father has had this issue. I just spent. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, a lot of family members are calling. Yeah, we just did a hotel yeah. trip. We stayed in Florida. My wife was up and down all night, all night, all night. Is there somewhere we can go? And so they kind of do it by probably zip code saying, okay, well, where are you located? And here's your professionals. How does somebody who wants to help with this, that's a physician, a, a sleep dentist, how do they get into your network so they can get these referrals? So, yeah, great question. So we've actually been asking um, our last expert advisory board meeting. Uh, there were a ton of different doctors that we have on that okay. board who were saying, oh, I actually have a lot of resources in my area. There was somebody that was in Illinois that right. had, because a lot of what the calls are about, and I know that you've talked on your podcast about this a lot, people who don't have access to really great 
healthcare coverage, so they yeah. don't have good insurance. Yeah. And they're kind of in that gap where they're trying to access, you know, sleep studies and, and care, you know, CPAP and all these different things, and they don't really know where to go. And so that's what we're building is this kind of database of all the different um, programs they can plug into in different areas. It's so varied across America. Well, if, if yeah. you know, I always use this, how can I be helpful? But I, I happen to know. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, and access to a lot of yeah. that. I, I, would know, I would yeah. love to be able to help out with that. Yeah. Because here's the important thing. You, you just hit on something and Anne's going to get fired up about this. That gap is frustrating. Yeah. It's- and on your podcast, you had mentioned something to me. I'm working with a couple different people outside of the United States. I love mission work. Yeah. Um, and so now uh, using kind of the, the connections that I have is getting CPAPs and all that to people who have zero insurance. Very poor, yes. and I want to get them screened and, and get them CPAPs, get mm-hmm. old devices, get yeah. whatever we need. Yeah. You know, um, you had mentioned that you had something like that on your podcast. I said, where could I get? I think we talked about the American Academy, or no, the American Sleep Apnea Association, okay. and they do have a program. Okay. There's, yeah. there's also so that's certainly where I'm sending people, and okay. so Heather has all of this information. <laughs> so, so I need to talk to Heather. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> people call the helpline. She has okay. like that at her fingertips yeah. yeah so there's also the reggie white foundation yes. they also have a it's program yeah. Yeah. yeah so those are the two places when people tell me you know even if they kind of get so far as getting a diagnosis and a prescription for a cpap mm-hmm. but they're looking at filling that prescription and their out-of-pocket cost is going to be sometimes a thousand dollars you know like yeah. it can if they, yeah. they haven't met a deductible it can sure. be really high sure. Sure. so those are places that i connect people with a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's well, wonderful. That's awesome. I think that really what we're seeing is that this is a, a not-for-profit who has taken on a mission that really should be a government-sponsored um, uh, effort. Uh, we do see this in the United Kingdom, right? Uh, Vicki Beaver is a, is a friend of mine, and she yeah. uh, runs the Sleep Charity, yes. and they have done incredible incredible work of really having a very similar model of how do we educate, how do we evolve, how do we fill the gap that clinicians aren't filling or the government isn't filling there. It actually is government funded them. They do get government grant funding. Um, uh, However, there's still struggles with that as well. So not saying that that it's so seamless, but it really is that call to action that we know at a societal level that everyone sleeps However, more and more people are sleeping poorly. And so being able to not only just do a screener, but also connect them to what the next step is becomes really highly relevant. And honestly, the amount of people that don't know that sleep is a specialty in medicine is staggering. You know, they're like, there's a doctor for that? So just even connecting people, you know, with a sleep specialist is a big step, I think. Yes, and I think that... Um, uh, knowing, like, I'm in the sleep field, we're all in the sleep field, knowing that all of these resources exist, but then also being able to say, well, who and when and why, because that sometimes is a challenge for me in in a clinical practice. I have my dot phrases, right? Like dot websites, dot whatever. And that's how I'm able to try and organize it. But it's still helpful to have an additional external resource because I never want to be the rate limiting step, right? If a patient wants to be empowered in their own journey, having these things readily available outside of a healthcare system is important because it allows for them to actually dictate what their journey is going to be rather than me being the barrier to getting to where they want. Yeah. Jeff. I think too, you know, Having access is the most important thing, and and for what you do is being that advocacy to go out and tell people about where to yeah. to do it. But that's not the, the step is still that person being compliant, yeah. you know. And 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 if you recognize that you have just like you have in your own journey that I have this sleep disorder, this is what I need to do. But it's still having them continues to take the Well, steps. I think I think though that that's the beauty when you look at Project Sleep, and especially Julie. So Julie will always talk about yeah. social support, right? Yes. Because we recognize this has been very well established in uh, the mental health literature that peer mentorship. So you don't need to be a medically trained nurse, doctor, APP, et cetera. You need to be a person who's living with the disorder to connect 
empathetically with another person living with a disorder and be able to model success. And when you model success, it, 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 it basically it empowers and it encourages an individual to say, I can do it too. I don't have to accept the lesser version of who I am. I don't have to accept that I can't breathe at night or I'm only going to get the four hours of sleep or that I'm going to be excessively sleepy and that limit every other social aspect of my life. So I do think that it's a great opportunity for there to be multimodal offering. So it's not just you have a hotline and here's some resources. It's I have a hotline, here's some resources. You found your community. You want to tell your own story. Let's show you how to do it. I mean, it really touches on so many different areas. And, And what I love is that it also is encouraging the use of other foundations, right? Hypersomnia Foundation, Wake Up Narcolepsy, American Sleep Apnea Association. These all have developed with the right intention. However, if you're the unfortunate individual who has OSA and insomnia and restless leg, and now it's, it's how can I, how do I know when and where or how to even access some of these other resources? So I think that's one of the things that drew me to Project Sleep in the first place was learning about the work that they were doing with um, advocacy in DC. So every year they have a sleep advocacy forum where they're inviting every single patient advocacy group. So anyone to do with anything to do with sleep is invited to go to that. And so we're so much more powerful together. Yes. Um, and I think that, you know, like there's just power in numbers. Like when we do our Hill Day, you know, there's a bunch of us, <laughs> yeah. you know, and I think if we didn't all like restless legs and narcolepsy different groups and and sleep apnea groups if we didn't join together that you know it's just not as powerful yes and it also helps in removing the idea of that we're speaking into an echo chamber right. so my biggest criticism that i've had in in regards to sleep is that it tends to be sleep people talking to other sleep people about sleep problems right. and us all going yeah, it's really important. Can't believe other people don't think it's important. And so uh, as a part of my role on the, um, I'm on the board of directors for the Sleep Research yes. so- Society's foundation, uh, some of the things that we've been discussing is how do we actually co-mingle across other disciplines, right? Yes. How do we partner with the American Academy of Neurology? How do we partner with the psychiatry um, academies? How do we partner with the American Heart Association? Because it is about being able to diversify and demonstrate the storyline of that this all matters together. The challenge in healthcare is that you have the patient who wants to do this, and these are the advocacy organizations, industries over here, clinical is over here, insurances are over here, very, very far away, not touching, definitely not touching the patient in any good way. Um, and so the reality is that a lot of what you're describing, especially with like Hilde and advocacy, um, uh, in uh, DC is that you also make sure that those other people are listening and having a voice as well. And so that shared voice definitely creates a strength that is much more difficult to ignore. And I think I always take a much bigger view. Like when I started my podcast, um, it seems so random that like a suburban mother of two, like would just randomly start a podcast about sleep apnea. But for me, it was, I was sitting in a doctor's office, not a sleep specialist office, just a regular doctor's office, had a really long wait, and I started reading a magazine, and it happened to have an article about sleep apnea in it. And the whole thing was about CPAP, and I'd been on CPAP at that point probably for like 10 years. And at the end, it was like, some people don't do well with CPAP. For them, there's oral appliance therapy and, uh, you know, surgeries with the NTs, and there, you know, is this Inspire implant thing. And I just thought, I don't know any of these things. And like, you know, I kind of kept thinking, like, there must be other people living with sleep apnea out there that don't know any of this. And so that was when I really started looking for a podcast I could listen to with like other people living with sleep apnea talking about their experience of all these different treatment options. And then when I didn't find it, I just decided to you know, go in the closet and <laughs> get recording. I just, I'm curious because I also geek out on all the new technology that's coming out, right? Yeah. I really like the sunrise, like stick on mm-hmm. strip thing that they, they did. So that was an interesting one that I tried, you know, last year. But I just listened to the Enzo Data webinar the other week where they're talking about using like a pulse oximeter, but their new AI way of 
reading that data and yes. like how they can use that to sure. test. So I just think the more, this is such a big problem. Like we don't have enough sleep specialists. We don't have enough, like even if every single person wanted to get diagnosed, we just don't have enough actual physical sleep. You know, we want to, I, I feel like we need to save that for all the people with all the different sleep disorders. So it's not just sleep apnea. Like there's a lot of people where their sleep apnea home test will be negative for sleep apnea. And I'm always encouraging people, if you have all of these symptoms yes. that drove you to get tested, you're going to now want to follow up and do an in-lab sleep study to figure out what's going on. 100%. Because it's it's like the number of people who, you know, have gone through that and, and uh, people just tell me their stuff all the time, which yes. I love. Yes. And so people are always emailing me and like, I listened to that podcast and then I went to get a you know, a test and they sent me home with this test and they said it was negative, but I'm feeling like super excessive daytime sleepiness and like all these different symptoms. And I'm like, so now you go back to your doctor and you yes. push to have an in-lab yes. sleep session. And that's an example, that, yeah. and that's an example okay. of the, the value of peer mentorship, right? Yes. Because if the limitation of what a patient um, on their medical journey knows to do is only based on the information they're getting from their healthcare partner, right? that's going to be the, the beginning and the end of that journey, right? And we see this plagues many people with different sleep disorders. For myself, for individuals who have narcolepsy and idiopathic hypersomnia, three to five different specialists telling you like it's normal or, or it's in your head or yes. it's depression, et cetera. Those now become your character traits rather than your pathology yes. that you're battling. Which is exactly what happened to me. So I, I kind of went probably at least 10 years with all of the symptoms and going to doctors with those symptoms and saying, I have daytime sleepiness, I have morning headaches, I'm waking up gasping. You know, now it's like, yeah, you should really get a test for obstructive sleep apnea. Yes. But at the time, I was told, you're stressed. You have insomnia. And, and then you're pregnant, so it's really normal to be tired when you're pregnant. Yes. Well, you know, it's so it took a long time, and I think that I just, I mean, what drives my work really is not having anyone else go through what I went through. Yes. And trying to make sure that everybody that has symptoms gets a diagnosis as quickly as possible. Yeah, and I think the other part that, that you've touched on is, is are we being as judicious as possible in regards to what is that algorithm or that approach to when someone is saying, I have a sleep complaint? Um, and so the knee-jerk reaction has now been conditioned to get a home sleep test. The reality is, is what was the role of the home sleep test? The home sleep test was developed for those who had a high positive predictive value for OSI. Yeah. So do you have, like, I can look at you and hear your story and I'm like, 99.9%. OSA is what your your challenge is. Let's get you diagnosed quicker. And the challenge with as we're moving into more of these streamlined, sexy, clean, yes, it's more, more accessible, but I have a more limited data set, yes. which now is limiting my understanding of your personalized needs or completely missing the mark whatsoever and not actually diagnosing the condition, per perpetuating the internalization of it must just be me that I'm just not one to work. Which is amazing how quickly you go to that. And especially for so many people, especially people with sleep apnea and anxiety and depression is almost always, I mean, like it's so prevalent in, in those people. And so I think sometimes, you know, people tell you, well, there's really nothing wrong here, nothing to see. Yes. And you're already feeling kind of low and you don't feel like pushing and advocating for yourself. Yes. And it just, yeah, the more that we can just normalize all of that and say, yeah, lots of people are in the same situation. Here's what you need to do to, for the betterment of your health, you know, and like. Yeah, I would say one of the things I'm excited about um, is if you remember last year, we had the Natus R&D team on, right? Um, and so Natus is one of the world's largest neurodiagnostic companies, um, and they live in the neurology space and the sleep space. Sleep is a neurology space, right? Um, and so they have. Spot the neurologist in the room. <laughs> So, we get it, Anne. Brain based. Uh, so they have um, ambulatory EEG. They have in lab polysomnographies. Yeah. They have um, uh, also a home sleep testing. Mm -hmm. They have in hospital EEGs. So I mean, when you're talking about the future directions, what I'm excited about are companies like that 
where if they're able to create the algorithms to be able to do these types of assessments, it's not just going to impact the person who's going, I have a sleep disorder. It's going to impact the person who has epilepsy, yes. who has different conditions that they yeah. may be getting these tasks. And you're creating a signal now for that person who is being treated to be like, hey, have you considered narcolepsy? Have you considered sleep apnea? Yes. And what's important about that paradigm is that you now not are not just treating a sleep disorder, you're using the treatment of a sleep disorder to better treat the person's primary medical condition. And so when we start actually unfolding the advancement in technologies where we're creating an ecosystem approach, that is what we need to do. The concern I have when I walk the exhibit hall are all the point solutions that don't talk to one another that then are going to result in the story that you yeah. you just described. Yeah. And I think another thing that I am actually really excited about, though. <laughs> She's like, I had enough time. I can, I can. I, I had can enough time that. to come up with one, but I am excited for remote patient monitoring over a longer yes. period of time. Yes. yes. Because it's astonishing how much, I think we're starting to realize People on CPAP. So I've been on CPAP now for 16 years. Wait, which is so only crazy. you don't have to monitor for just 90 days? Sarcastic, <laughs> sorry. But so I find often, you know, people are kind of thinking, well, I mean, it's amazing that this machine tells you, like, this is how many events you had and all of this. But it's not infallible. Like, yes. there's, you know, so I think that it's one of those things where monitoring the actual patient for what's happening with their heart and, yes. you know, over a longer period of time is so useful. And I think we're going to see more of that. I have a, I'm very excited about uh, the new gene uh, testing that they're doing. Uh, I, I don't believe in coincidence. Everybody knows I believe that's God's way of staying anonymous. And so on my flight, I had to sit on the tarmac for an hour and a half. The person sitting next to me, I'm not allowed to say any names, yeah. <laughs> uh, he's doing some really cool stuff, and she's actually giving a talk tomorrow. They're calling it the fatigue gene. And so wow. right now they have tested 100 patients, and it, it is fascinating to me. What I've always tried to say is that we don't treat sleep apnea and, and narcolepsy, other things like we do diabetes or whatever. Yes. So the, the earlier onset that we can, can find out. So that's all in its infant stage. Um, Always good to see you. Uh, just yes. like you manifested with Julie to be your best friend, I have been manifesting... <laughs> For us to, to be best and friends, here I now, am. Uh, for, for you to be on the podcast. Uh, I'm so blessed to, to have this space and for you to come on today. And I love Thank you for it. having me. Appreciate it. And uh, last and not least, thank you for sleeping around with Dr. Anna Matthew. Thank you so much for having me. We're just keeping it between sleep friends. We are. Did this episode leave you wanting more? Then make sure you subscribe and check out this episode right here. <laughs>